Okay, well, uh, this is Dr. Morton, and I'm. Uh, this is the second lecture in the uh, introduction to um, uh, computer engineering series. And in this lecture, I want to give a little brief introduction to the uh, to number systems, uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, how we convert from one base to another. Uh, of course, uh, I'm going to show you how to do it by hand, but in truth, you're not going to do it by hand. You're going to use tools. Uh, but uh, interestingly, a lot of the calculator-based tools, um, and even tools you find on the internet, won't uh, convert the fractional portion. So if you, like say for instance, you want to invert something like 953.78 to decimal, uh, I mean to binary, uh, that's not so difficult. Uh, but you have to do the fractional portion differently. But if if you want to convert, um, say, you know, uh, something from base 4 to base 7, good luck finding uh, something that will do that. So we'll show you how to do those things just for grins. Um, not so much that these are things you will actually need to do, but, uh, it, but you need to understand uh, how number systems work, and you certainly need to understand uh, the conversion. One of the interesting things that happens inside of a computer whenever you type in your decimal numbers, uh, the computer converts these decimal numbers into an internal format that depends on whether you're typing in an integer or whether you're typing in a, a floating point number. By floating point we mean that uh, that you have um, the ability to uh, uh, put it in scientific notation, uh, you can have something like uh, uh, 263 times 10 to the minus 7th, uh, or you can have, uh, you know, $25.53. Uh, uh, we sometimes refer to the $25.53 as fixed point notation, uh, but uh, and we refer to something where you can have um, almost any power, uh, you, you can have as small a number as, as you can fit into the computer. Uh, there's a couple of interesting points about this. When we put things into a floating point notation, we we typically use uh, a notation called uh, IEEE 753, 753, which is a standard way of representing floating point numbers. And, uh, and I'll probably throw a little bit about that in at the end, although not too much because it's very intimidating. And in addition to that, the IEEE 753 standard just changed this year, uh, back in January of 2000. So, um, so it's good to. Uh, so I don't want to say too much about it because uh, um, uh, there are. It's a little more complicated even than uh, than what I would present. So, uh, so I'll just give you a little flavor for it. Um, the 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 standard uh, definitions for IEEE 753. Uh, were a 32-bit representation we called floating point in say in C we call it floating point, and uh, and uh, and similarly in other languages, and then the uh, the expanded uh, definition was uh, a 64-bit uh, representation which we called double, uh, that would be a double floating point, and uh, so those two haven't changed, but what did change in the standard was they introduced uh, some new uh, 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 bit widths, including a 24-bit uh, a wide floating point just to uh, shrink it down so it doesn't take quite as many bytes to fit it in. Uh, anyway, uh, that having been said, uh, you know, why don't we get started? So I'll, I'll do some of these things with slides and then I'll do some of these things, uh, uh, I'll, I'll just write some things out too. Okay, so first let me, um, I'll shrink myself down and I'm going to, I'm going to Put up this and then let me just add myself back here and see if I can do this all right now and hopefully there'll be room up here for me we'll see okay so something like this and I think I'm gonna oh, I'd be okay so so here's a uh, here's a, here's our standard decimal number 953.78 now how, what does this mean so a couple of things that are very interesting. First off, we 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 uh, we we base everything from this little point, and we call it the decimal point, but that's only really relevant when we're in the decimal system. So 
we use the same point in binary and hex uh, and other systems, but we really couldn't call it a decimal point there since it's not a base 10 system and decimal refers to 10. So what it really is is just a point. And, uh, and everything to the left of this point is represented by, uh, by powers of the base, in this case 10, starting with uh, 10 to the 0 power and going in increasing power. So 10 to the 0, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2. And that's why we call, say, the 9 times 10 to the 2, so that's 900 because 10 to the 2 is 100. Times 10 to the 1, that's 5 times 10 or 50. Now, interestingly, uh, 10 to the 0 power is 1. Now, I, I don't know if you've ever looked at this, but mathematically, that's a curiosity too. Um, because, uh, well, it, it is. You should uh, pull up a video that talks about uh, raising things to the 0 power and see that it's actually... Uh, it's actually sort of a limiting result. It's kind of interesting, and that's why we define it as uh, as uh, multiplying by one. So any base to the zero power is one. Uh, anyway, uh, so that's how we get nine times a hundred plus five times ten uh, plus three times one are nine hundred fifty three. Now, working to the right of the decimal point, we deal in negative powers of 10, negative powers of the base. In this case, the base is 10, so that would be 10 to the minus 1. We start with minus 1, even though we start with 0 on the left side of the decimal point. So 7 to, times 10 to the minus 1 are 7 tenths, plus 8 times 10 squared are 8 one hundredths. So what we have then is 78 one hundredths. Uh, and that's, that's what this means, and we add all that up and we get this. Okay, so let's, let's look at how that how that actually is. So the 9 is times 10 squared, the 5 is times 10 to the 1, the 3 is times 10 to the 0, the 7 is times 10 to the minus 1, and the 8 is times 10 squared, to minus 2 rather, uh, or 1 over 100. So 8 one hundredths, 7 tenths. And that of course, uh, that, that of course gives us the uh, the resulting number. And in our heads, we do this automatically in the base 10 system. So we can look at numbers and, uh, well, let me go back for one second. We can look at 953.78 and we, we understand intuitively what that means. However, if we look at 1111.11, we don't understand intuitively what that means. Uh, it's actually, it's actually, it's actually uh, a little bit difficult. Now, I happen to know that 1111 is 15. And I also happen to know that the first one to the right of the of the point here, the binary point, is one half, and I know that this is one fourth. So it's actually it's actually fifteen and three fourths. So I can I can kind of read this, but I I can't read anything more complicated than 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 just this few numbers. It, once you start putting more numbers out here, I I can't look at it and really tell. Uh, I can I can have a rough idea, but still I I, I haven't learned how to do that and it, and it takes a lot of time. That's what you started learning when you were in first grade in kindergarten and you've been working on that your entire time in school. Um, so all of our mental calculations are done in decimal. Even when we get pretty familiar with binary, we still don't do much in the way of binary. We still, we still think of it in terms of decimal. It's like learning a language. Uh, I know a few words in Spanish. I know, I know some French. I took some German. Uh, but I can't think in either of those, any of those languages. I think in English. Uh, but when you get really, really good in a language, then you start thinking in it. Um, okay, well, anyway, so here we are. Uh, in this case, what does this mean? Exactly the same thing. We start at the, at the point. In this case, it, it's the binary point. And we take the first digit to the left of the point, and we multiply it by 2 to the 0 power. The next digit by 2 to the 1. Now, if it's a 0, obviously then we, that would be 0. Uh, but if it's a 1, then that's 2. And the next one would be 4 or not. And the next one would be 8 or 0. Okay? And then working to the right of decimal point, we take this digit times 2 to the minus 1 or 1 half. And then the next digit, if it's a 1, then that would be 1 fourth. So 1 half plus 1 fourth is 3 fourths. Okay, so um, in 1 plus 2 uh, Plus, sorry, one, one, uh, one plus two 
plus 4 plus 8 is uh, 15. All right, so let's let's uh, so that makes it 15 and uh, 3 fourths. How about hexadecimal? Same thing. We start with uh, um, we start with the base of 16, and we uh, in this case say a32. I didn't do a fractional portion, uh, so the two is times 16 to the one, so that's two times zero or two. Three times 16 to the to the one, so that is 16, and then a are 10 times 16 squared. I, I don't know off the top of my head what 16 squared is. I'd have to look it up. I haven't memorized it. But uh, when you multiply all that out, that gives you its decimal equivalent. Again, we're doing this math over here. This is in decimal. And this is in decimal. So that you can understand what these values are. And I'm not going to talk about octo much. Octo used to be quite popular in the the digital design and uh, computer world, because uh, quite a few of our uh, quite a few of our uh, processors had instruction sets that were nice multiples of four, but uh, of three rather, but not of four. And so, uh, so we often used hex. Or well, it just was a nicer way to break down. Uh, some of the instructions were 12-bit instructions, and uh, it was easier to under the, understand the instructions if you broke it down into four uh, four parts which meant you had to use octal. Now let me say one additional thing here, uh, and it's also true about decimal. Uh, when we have, say, a base 10 system, how many different symbols does it take to represent a number in base 10? Well, not surprisingly, it takes 10 symbols. Now the biggest symbol you can think of is 9, right? So how is it 10 symbols? Well, you have to count 0, too. And in fact, in the entire digital design world, you always have to think, start with zero. And if you don't think that, then you're going to make some mistakes uh, that will be uh, uh, disquieting to you. So we have 10 symbols in the, in the decimal system, and they are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Okay, great. Now, in the, uh, in the binary system, it's base 2. How many symbols do we need for binary? Well, it's base 2. We just need two symbols. And what would they be? Well, they're 0 and 1. Now, that happens to work really well for digital logic because in, in, the, uh, in, in the switching algebra subset of Boolean algebra, we require all variables to either be zeros or 1s, nothing else. And this makes all sorts of things uh, possible and more interesting, but it also <clears throat> allows us to have a, a, a very strong tool for doing digital design, for manipulating our expressions. And so we have to learn this whole new algebra called switching algebra to do it. Uh, and interestingly, switching algebra uh, only has about 15 rules. And if you know those 15 rules, uh, that's all you, that is all you can do. Uh, each of those rules has a kind of a dual. Uh, so I guess you could say there's close to 30 rules, but, but it, the 15 really different rules. And, uh, and that's how we manipulate logic expressions. We use switching algebra. And in these expressions, we only allow variables to be zeros or ones. We only allow constants to be zeros or ones. All right, so uh, how, about, how about octal? How many, how many octal is base 8? How many symbols do we need for octal? 8, you're right. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And that makes our 8 symbols. Ah, but what about hexadecimal? It's base 16. How many symbols do we need for hexadecimal? Hmm, 16. Is that a problem? Well, it is kind of a problem because when uh, way back when we sort of created the uh, the the ASCII uh, system for coding letters and numbers and punctuation marks and other stuff, special characters and even non-printing characters, we only included the symbols for numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And so rather than bite the bullet and do the right thing and make up six more unique symbols, so we would have 16 unique symbols for, for, for hexadecimal numbers, they stole. And what did they steal? They stole letters from the alphabet. 
Now, I maintain this was a bad thing to do. Uh, why do I think it was a bad thing to do? Well, I'll tell you. Because in uh, we don't have, there is no such thing as an uppercase 9 and a lowercase 9. There's no such thing as an uppercase 5 and a lowercase 5, or an uppercase 3 and a lowercase 3. Numbers only come in one size. They only come in one format. But when you steal A, B, C, D, E, F from the alphabet to use as numbers in hexadecimal, ah, now you have a problem. Because your A that you stole can be uppercase or lowercase. The F that you stole can be uppercase or lowercase. And so you actually have complicated, when you write code to recognize these, these digits for the hexadecimal system, now you have to make special exceptions for the upper six digits of A, B, C, D, E, F. You have to be able to recognize both lower and uppercase letters. Because as sure as the Lord made little green apples, somebody is going to use an uppercase and somebody else is going to use a lowercase. You know that's going to happen. So if you don't account for that and make these special rules for recognizing two different versions of the same symbol, uh, you're going to have massive problems. But making two different ways to recognize the same symbol for a hexadecimal number is extra work. And it's confusing. And sometimes you can have a, a hexadecimal number like bad, B-A-D. Well, did you mean the word bad or did you mean a hexadecimal number? Well, darn it. You don't know. It's based on usage and the intent of the person that created it. So as a result, now we've had to come up with other ways to mark hexadecimal numbers. And uh, some, some people used a dollar sign to mark hexadecimal numbers, but then that's a little confusing, right? Uh, I think the most common one is to, put a, is to put 0x in front of the number. So for instance, for A32, what we would write is 0x A32. And now we've stated pretty clearly it's a hexadecimal number. But this creates more work and overhead too. Why couldn't we have just come up with uh, six more symbols to represent uh, the extra six we needed? Or maybe even better, why couldn't we have just come up with 16 unique symbols for hexadecimal? That would have been cool. Uh, maybe that will still happen someday. Maybe one of you will create those symbols. All right. Well, anyway, uh, there's where we are. So, so, the, so that's how we define bases. And, uh, of course, any number, any, any uh, integer number could be a base. I suppose you could even, even allow fractional numbers to be bases, but that would get kind of crazy, wouldn't it? Because uh, how would you have, uh, let's say you had base 8.5, how would you have 8.5 symbols? Oh, there's the problem, right? So you really pretty much have to restrict your bases to integers for it to make any real sense. Um, okay, so how about conversion? How do we do conversion? Well, here's the interesting thing. Why do you think that hexadecimal has become popular. Why not base 12? Why not base uh, 9? Why not base 6? Why not base 4? Or base 3? And, and the answer is, um, the answer is that the earliest computers, for whatever reason, tended to do things in powers of 2. So, so we often used uh, word sizes that were nice powers of 2. And uh, all, almost uh, the very earliest computer, well, the Intel, the first Intel chip was a, was a 4004. And, uh, well, they might have made something before then, but that was the first computer on a chip uh, that I'm aware of, at least. And uh, the 4004 was a 4-bit based computer. And then they came out with the 8008. That was an 8-bit. And that's when really everything took off and exploded. And then there were other chips that came out, um, the 6502 and, and a whole bunch of others. Uh, but but uh, all of these co early computers had uh, used uh, a data size of 8 bits, partly because that's a nice power of 2. It's the next power of 2 after 4 bits. And it lets you do a little more work, and it makes a little more sense. And then, of course, as things went on, we had generations of computers as they evolved. We went from 8-bit computers to 16-bit to 32-bit, and now we're kind of at 64-bit computers. Uh, we have 64-bit operating systems now in our big Intel and AMD chips. Um, still powers it too, right? Uh, and I guess the next 
bigger chips will probably be 128 bit chips. But there's problems with that because uh, frequently you don't need 128 bits. You're, the values you're moving around aren't, those, aren't that big. And so uh, we may be at the point of diminishing returns when it comes to uh, bit widths. Well, uh, so, so back to why did we have uh, hex and octal? Well, partly because they're powers of two. But, and in fact, I guess that's almost exclusively the reason. Uh, but, but octal's fallen out of favor. And so now we're pretty well left with decimal, binary, and hex. And the interesting thing, maybe the cool thing, is that, that binary and hex and octal all have a very special relationship with each other. It's super easy to convert from one to the other. I, I can do it practically in my sleep and you could too because it's super easy but going from decimal to any of those is rather difficult and you can't do it in your sleep except for small numbers that you might have memorized so uh, are even powers of two in decimal so like for 32 yeah I know what that is uh, and 64 and 128 but um, but for anything else it gets a little dicey all right so uh, so why do binary and hexadecimal and for that matter, octal, although we don't use it that much anymore, have these special relationships. And the answer is that one hexadecimal digit exactly fits into four binary bits. And it's also true that one octal digit exactly fit into three binary bits. Um, so, so that's why we have this special relationship with, between binary and hex. And that's why it's super easy to do the conversion. Now, is there a special relationship between binary and decimal? No, there isn't. Because one decimal digit fits into, uh, fits into uh, let's see, 10 sixteenths or 5 eighths of a hex digit. And it fits into... Uh, five-eighths of four binary bits. But it doesn't go in evenly. And when it doesn't go in evenly, then that causes all sorts of problems uh, and makes it very difficult to do the, uh, to do the conversion you know, in your head. OK, so let's talk about how we do this conversion. So let's see. So yeah, this is kind of what I said. I'm just going to skip this. So here are the special, here are the hex numbers past 10 or 10 and above. So the symbols for 0 through 9 are obvious. We use 0 through 9 for the 0 through 9 hex digits. But A, but for 10, we don't write it 1, 0, we write it A. And for B, we don't, you know, we don't write 11, we write B. And for 12, we write C, and for 13, D, and 14, E, and 15, F. Now when we get to 16, we write, in hexadecimal, we write 16, 1, 0. But you have to remember that's base 16. Otherwise, you'd think you had written 10. All right. So, uh, so all we have to do is we take, let's say we have a binary number like this, 10100001011. One, zero, one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, one, zero, one. I can look at this and I can tell you that that's A to D right there. Because 1010 is A. 0010 is 2, and 1101 is D. And, and I would recommend that you make a little chart like this. You write down the hex digits, the decimal equivalent, and the binary equivalent, and you memorize this entire chart today. You will use it the rest of your engineering life. So you might as well do it today. And it's really handy and nice. You should be able to look at like 1100 and know that that is 12 and hex C. And you shouldn't have to think about it. And 1010 is 10, and it's A, and so forth. Now, these are easy. You know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Those are easy. 1, 0, 0, 0 is 8, and 1, 0, 0, 1 is 9. And then, but the rest of these, you sort of have to start memorizing. Of course, 1, 1, 1, 1 is obviously 15 and F. But you should memorize this chart. You should have it down cold because it will really help you. Okay, now, um, 
if we want to convert binary to octal, we just take three bits at a time. But I'm not going to really talk about octal much because uh, it's not really useful. But what I, I do want to mention are how do we represent negative numbers? Now, if, we, if we're using integers, we, if you had a little exposure to any computer language, you know that we often, um, we often code our numbers as signed or unsigned. In C, you have to specify. And once you declare it, uh, that's what they are. If if you have uh, a, a unsigned number, then you get to use all the bits that you've set aside for that number. Now, in in most C implementations, an integer is is 16 or maybe 32 bits. All right. So if it's 16 bits, you can go up to 65,000 as an integer, uh, and if it's 32, you can get up to 4 billion, basically. But if, it's, but if it's signed, you just get half that. Uh, and that actually can get people into trouble. Um, sometimes when they're writing C code, they'll forget that, they, that the number might be considered signed if they didn't specify it. By default, it's signed. And if they wanted to execute a for loop 40,000 times, but they didn't specify an unsigned uh, index, when it gets to 32, uh, when it gets past 32K, uh, 32,000 roughly, it'll flip over into the negative range and, and, and uh, the comparison that you're doing in your loop will, will fail and uh, your code won't execute correctly. So that's, that's a big problem. Uh, and um, so anyway, uh, so you have to specify. How do we represent negative numbers in computers? Well, if you think about it, there's several different ways you could do it. And of the ways that you could do it, uh, there are three popular ways were sort of proposed and, and are talked about. Uh, one, one is called sign and magnitude. You pick one of your bits and you just let that be a sign bit. And then the other bits are the, are the magnitude. Another way to do it is just to, is just to flip the bits and make, uh, if you flip the bits, that's your negative number. Another way to do it is to flip the bits and add one. And we call that two's complement. If we just flip the bits, we call that one's complement. But if we flip the bits and add one, we call that two's complement. Now, I don't know why they call it two's complement. It confuses me too. But because because uh, you would think flip the bits and add one should be one's complement. And flip the bits and add nothing should be none's complement or something. I don't know. Or just the complement. But in any event, it turns out of these three methods, sine and magnitude, one's complement, and two's complement, one of them has has some significant advantages, really one big advantage. And uh, what is that? What is that big advantage? Well, the big advantage is that in two's complement, we only have one representation for zero. Whereas in sine and magnitude, obviously this, you can have the magnitude be zero, but the sine bit could be positive or negative. So that gives you two representations. And in one's complement, it turns out it. Uh, that there are there are also two representations for zero, um, and so that's a problem. And but in two's complement there aren't, and so I, I I'm not going to talk much more about this, but I will show you how to do a, a two's complement. So we'll, we'll we'll do that in a minute too. All right, I think what I'm going to do now, um, yeah. So uh, so I'm going to skip through these. Um, the reason why two's complement it has won this war between sine and magnitude, one's complement, and two complement for, for the internal negative representation of numbers in binary in a computer is because the hardware is much simpler if you use two's complement. And to get the same thing done, you have to screw around with the hardware a lot more for sine magnitude and one's complement. And so that's that's why that's, that's one. And the big reason for that is uh, that... Uh, there's only one representation for zero. Uh, okay, um, conversion from decimal to a base R. Well, I'm not going to do it generically. I'm just going to do it for. Uh, so let's do this. So I'm going to I'm going to uh, switch me over here, uh, make this big, and I'm going to. Oh, I didn't turn it on. Okay, so here I am, 
and I'm going to uh, do this. Okay, so for a minute, I'm going to go back to my slides. So let me do that. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, I, I'm going to take a decimal 53.625, and I'm going to show you how we have to treat the integer portion of this number differently than we do the decimal portion. Now, the integer portion is going to convert to this, and the decimal portion is going to convert to this. So the final number would be 110101.101. But we don't compute them all together. We have to do the fractional portion differently. And then I'll, then we'll just, for fun, we'll show you how to do 231.3 base 4 to base 7. Now to do this, uh, because we're uh, constrained to only use decimal mathematics, because our, our heads only grasp decimal mathematics, and we can't think in terms of any other mathematics, we have to go through the base 10 number. So we have to convert 231.3 base 4 to 45.75 base 10, to 63.5151515151515 and so forth, base 7. Now we just truncated it. We probably should have truncated it at uh, the first 5.1. And that also illustrates a rather interesting thing. This 0.3 is 3 fourths. Well, 3 fourths works fine in, in decimal, but it doesn't work fine in base 7. And that's also true. Many of the numbers we convert from decimal into binary or hex. Uh, we may have a non-terminating fraction in decimal that that is non-terminate we, uh, we that is terminating in binary or terminating in bi a non-terminating binary that's terminating in decimal. So that can cause some data loss when we do these conversions. And uh, and and any program where you can't afford data loss, like in a mathematical program that's uh, doing computations for banks and interest rates and things like that. Uh, they don't actually convert things into fractional portions. They maintain them as, as integer ratios where you preserve all, your, all of your significance, no matter what base you're in. Okay, so let's do this. Um, okay, so I'm going to do 53.625. Um, and then we'll come back and pick up the other one here in a minute. All right, so let me pop this back up. Okay, so 53.625. Okay, something like that. Hopefully that'll work. And let's see if I got that right. Yeah. All right. Okay, now I'm going to click on here once. Okay. Okay, 53.625. And I think I'm still crooked somehow. All right. All right, now, like I said, we have to do the integer portion separately. So the integer portion, we do this, we do this thing, we call, we, it looks like a funny division thing. We do the division sign upside down, and we divide by the base. Now, we're going to go to, we're going to go to binary, so we're going to divide by the base 2. So 53 divided by 2 is 26, with a remainder of 1. 2 into 26 is 13, with a remainder of 0. 2 into 13 is 6, with a remainder of 1. 2 into 6 is 3, with a remainder of 0. 2 into 3 is 1, with a remainder of 1. And 2 into 1 is 0, with a remainder of 1. So all we have to do then is we just rotate this kind of like this, and we get a number that is uh, 53 then equals, this is the low order bit, so it's 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. And there's our point right there. And it's kind of funny that the first remainder is the low order bit. You'd think it would be the higher order bit. But the reason it is more logically the low order bit is this first remainder tells us if it's an even or odd number. And that's we have to look at the first bit to see if it's even or odd, right? If that were zero, that'd be an even number. If it's a one, it's an odd number, which it is in this case. 
All right, what about the 625? Well, here we go now. So we take 0.625 and we multiply it by the base. So the base is 2. So we multiply 2 times 5 is 10. Put down your 0, carry your 1. 2 times 2 is 4 and 1 is 5. 2 times 6 is 12. Put down your 2 decimal point and a 1. Now what we do, we take away, if this is a 1, we take this away and we, we put it just to the right of the decimal point here. And then, uh, now this is gone, and we multiply this. 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times 5 is 10, carry 1, 2 times 2 is 4, and 1 is 5, 0. So now we take this one, and we put it right next, it's a 0. And then 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times 0 is 0, 2 times 5 is 10, 0, and carry your 1. And then we take this one and put it here. Oh, sorry. Put a 1 there. And so now we have 1, 0, 1. And uh, so, uh, and what's left over is 0, so there's no point in multiplying it. It's going to be 0 for the rest of the time. So we're done. Now, some, if, if we're not done, sometimes we get into a non-terminating situation where we, we get a pattern, like the 5, 1, 5, 1, 5, 1, 5, 1. But uh, sometimes it terminates. In this case, it did. And uh, that's because uh, 0.625, that fraction, uh, which is, what is that, 5 eighths, I think. Uh, so 5 eighths obviously fits into, it's a power of 8, so that's going to work. And in fact, oh, look at that. We have 101. One, that's 5. And this is half, quarter, eighths. So we have 5 eighths. So that makes sense. All right. So that's how, so when we do, when we convert, uh, when we convert 53.625 in the binary, it equals 110101.101. I can't write very well, apparently. All right. So that's how we do that conversion. Now, normally, we, we just use our calculator, but I will tell you, your calculator probably won't let you put a fractional portion on and do the conversion. Uh, I bet it won't. Uh, they're kind of picky for some reason. Uh, okay, now what about the other problem I mentioned when we wanted to go from uh, 231.3 base 4 to base 7? What about that? Well, let's look at that one. All right, so so I'll write that down, 231.3 base 4. All right, so let's do that. And here we are. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do, we're going to use powers of 4. So, so this is going to be 3 times, uh, 3 times 4 to the minus 1. This is going to be 1 times 4 to the 0. 3 times 4 to the 1, and 2 times 4 to the 2. Well, so, so 2 times 4 squared is 16. So that's 2 times 16 plus 3 times, uh, 3 times 4 plus 1 plus 3 fourths. All right, so 2 times 16 is 32 plus 3 times 4 is 12 plus 1. So that's going to be 45, 45 45.75, because 3 fourths is 75. All right, so that equals 45.75 base 10. Now, um, let's make sure we're good so far. Yeah, it looks okay. Now, now we're going to go to base 7. So we have 45.75 base 10, and we want to go to base 7. How do we do it? Same thing we did before. So we start with the integer portion, and we'll do the fractional portion in a minute. So we take 45, and we divide by 7. So 45 divided by 7 is 6, right? 6 times 7 is 42. So, so that's 6, and a remainder of 45 minus 42 is 3. Right? Or did I do that wrong? Uh, yeah, 3. And then, uh, 
7 divided by 6 is 0, or rather, 6 divided by 7 is 0, with a remainder of 6. Okay, so this is our low order, this is our high order, so that's going to give us 63 point something. Now, the 75, we have to do it the same way as we did in binary, 0 0.75 times 7, which is our new base. So 5 times 7 is 35, put on your 5, carry your 3. 7 times 7 is 49, and 3 is 52, put on your 2 and carry your 5. All right, so this 5 then goes up here, and we're left with 7 times 0 0.25, because this now turns into 0. 7 times 5 is 35, put on your 5, carry your 3. 7 times 2 is 14, and 3 is... 14 and 3 is 17, so put on your 7 and your 1. And then the 1 goes up here. Now we're, this goes away, now we're left with 7 times 75. Well, that's just what we did here. So we can instantly see that we're going to be in a repeating sequence. 5, 1, 5, 1, 5, 1. So we just stop it here and call that base 7. 63 point. 5-1, base 7. Okay. So, uh, so you can see that's how we do conversions. And uh, it works in any base. But I promised you that I'd go back to 2's complement. And so I'm going to do that. So uh, I'll just touch on this briefly. This is also, if you're ever going to do any work in the digital world, you have to know this. Uh, so, because 2's complement is universally used. All right, so let's look at two's complement. So, so first off, let me. So let's take a. Let's take. A, we'll, we'll start with the fifty-three we did before. Okay. So here's a number, one one zero one zero one. Now, if I were to take the two's complement, well, first of all, th there's a problem. Let, let me just say a few things before we come back to this. So, if you have, so. Before you, t so remember an unsigned number can be can be twice as big as a signed number for the same for 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 you know for some number of bits say uh, for per number of bits. So let's say we have. 4 bits. So in 4 bits, our sign number, we can vary from 0 to 15. But our unsigned, we can go from a minus 8 all the way to a plus 7. Now that doesn't seem right. Why do you get one more negative than you get positive? The answer is that, that on the negative side, there is no negative 0. So on, so you have minus 8, minus 7, minus 6, minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1. But there is no minus 0. And on the positive side, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So you actually have exactly the same number on the plus and the minus sides. But it's just that you have to have 0. So it takes... it 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 appears that you have one less on the positive side, but you don't. You have the same. It's just that your biggest number is plus 7, and your smallest number is minus 8. And that's true in every base. So, for instance, uh, we use 8 bits a lot. And in the 8-bit world, we can go from minus 128 to positive 127. Same exact reason. But if we did it unsigned, that's signed, unsigned, we can go from 0 to 255. And of course, when you count the 0 in as one of the counts, then you get 256 different things. But your biggest number is 255, not minus either. That's, a, that's an arrow. 0 to 255. So you can see right off, uh, 
you better be clear in your mind whether you're declaring numbers as signed or unsigned because you only get half the room for, for unsigned. Okay, now back to our original number. Now there's a problem with this number and taking two's complement. And the problem is this number already exceeds half the space reserved for six bits. Because if you think about it, in six bits, the biggest number you can have in six bits uh, is two to the sixth. Well, two to the sixth minus one. Uh, so two to the sixth is going to be uh, 64, right? And minus one would be 63. So unsigned in six bits, we can go from zero to 63. But uh, the problem is, and that gives us 64 things. Again, but you have to count zero, so that's why we only get to go to 63. But this number is 53. So clearly, it's way more than half of our of our of our space here, and and in our unsigned world, we only get half. So in the unsigned, we can go from minus 64 all the way to plus 63. I'm sorry, I didn't. That's totally wrong. We can go from minus 32 to plus 31. So 53 is not going to work as a signed number in six bits. And that's one of the biggest problems we have to deal with. So fortunately, we can pad this out. We'll pad it out to eight bits by adding zeros at the top because it's a positive number. Now, let's do the two's complement. The way you do two's complement, you invert every bit and add one. So I'll just switch every bit. Zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one. And then I'm going to add one. And that's just going to give me 1100101. One, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one. Now, there's a better way to do this, and I'll do it down here because I'm out of room up there. Uh, if I write the same number, 00110101, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one, zero, one, and I want to switch this, uh, I, want, I, want to, I want to take the twos complement. So I can switch every bit and add one, and that's how the computer is going to do it. But uh, humans, don't want to do that addition step if they don't have to, uh, because here it was easy because I, I I just had a zero, but if I'd had a, if I had three or four ones here, I would have had to do a bunch of carries and it would have gotten complicated, not that complicated, but not fun. So an easier way to do it is you start from the right side, you copy bits till you get to the first one, you copy that, and then you flip everything else. So I would have just copied the one, there weren't any zeros, copy the one, and then the next bit. I start flipping one zero one zero zero one one and I get the exact same thing I got up there by inverting every bit and adding one okay so that's the two's complement now let me say a couple things this 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 value here equals minus 53 in eight bits as a signed number two's complement Okay, so that's that's what we got. Sign number two's complement. This number zero zero one one zero one zero one. That was our original number equals positive fifty three in eight bits. Sign two's complement number. Now notice, it turns out the upper bit is always zero for a positive number, and the upper bit is always one for a negative number in two's complement. Uh, yeah. But that doesn't mean that that upper bit is really the signed bit. We still use this bit in all the calculations. And it, it's not treated any differently than any other bit. But it just works out that it is a signed bit. So this is the best of both worlds. We essentially have uh, a, a, an automatic sign and magnitude representation, kind of, where the upper bit's always a signed bit. But we don't have two representations for zero. Now, why is that? Why do I say we don't have two representations for zero? Well, let's let's so remember. Uh, let's go back to our to our uh, four bit example. It's a little easier to show in four bits. So remember, in four bits, in four bits, we have we can go from a minus eight to a plus seven. 
So let's let's see what happens. What happens when we what happens when we try and convert zero? Can we take zero and complement it? Uh, use two's complement it. What do we get? Are, will we get something weird if we do that? Well, let's do it and see what happens. So we'll take four bits of zero, 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 zero. And now, which method do you want to use? Invert every bit and add one? Let's do that. One, 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 plus one. One plus one is zero, carrier 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 one. Well, there's no place for this one, so we just throw this one away. We have a one over here, but we're just going to throw it away. So, son of a gun. When we took the two's complement of zero, we got zero. Well, what if we do the other method? Copy zeros till you get to the first one. Copy that and invert everything else. Okay, so here's our number. Copy the zero. Copy the zero. Copy the zero. Copy the zero. We never got to the first one. Son of a gun. It didn't change anything. Well, now you're going to say, okay, what about minus 8? What happens if we take the 2's complement of minus 8? What are we going to get then? Well, that's a little, that's even more interesting. Let's write the minus 8. So the minus 8 is actually 1, 0, 0, 0, believe it or not. Let's complement that. So we copy every 0 till we get to the first 1 and copy that. 0, 0, 0, 1. Son of a gun. What the heck? We got the same thing. What, let's do it the other way. Maybe it's different. One zero zero. Let's invert every bit. One 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 zero and add one. One plus one is zero. One plus one is zero. One plus one is zero. Carrier one. Son of a gun. We got it again. So you can see that when it's all said and done. Let's. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to do that. Let's do this. Switch the camera. And make it big. All right. So when it's all said and done, you can now see that two's complement is magical. It takes away all our problems. And as a, ben as a bonus, we get one extra negative value. Because if you had two representations for zero, you would lose one of your negative numbers. And we don't do that. We actually get it. We can use it. And yet if we try and complement that number, it doesn't even work. We stay where we are. It's kind of a crazy thing, right? So in any event, and, and there are not two representations for zero. Now one of the funny things is, if you're adding up unsigned numbers, then then one of the things you always want to do is uh, is you want to uh, you want to remember that that if you're adding unsigned numbers, and let's say let's say you have four bits, okay? And let's say you add you add 15 and 15. Well, clearly you're you're going to get 30. Well, 30 doesn't fit in four bits. You've overflowed. And and uh, what happens is then uh, you would get something like uh, I don't know. I, I'm not going to do the math, but but you but you get a binary number in in five bits that it represents 30. And uh, and that's fine, but you didn't have five bits to put that number in. You only had four bits. So typically in a computer, when that happens, the carry bit gets that extra digit, that extra bit. And so after you do an addition, if your carry bit is a one, means you overflowed. But in two's complement math, we we pay no attention to that carry bit. We ignore it. Totally ignore the carry bit. And let's see, I think I had somewhere in there. I think I do have this. Yeah. Uh, right. So uh, I'll shrink myself down here. And uh, let's see. Yeah. So when we do when we do two's complement math, we detect an overflow a different way. We we completely ignore the carry bit. It, it doesn't help us. But what we can do is we can check to see if the two numbers we added are positive, then we expect a positive result. And if we get a negative result, we overflowed. 
And if the two numbers we added were negative, then we expect a negative result. And if we get a positive result, we overflowed. If the two numbers we're adding, one is negative and one is positive, we can never overflow. So we don't even have to worry about it. So we, so we do those two checks. Are the numbers the same sign? We better have the same sign for the result. And if we don't, it's an overflow. And we can represent that as a logic expression and check it. And many of our, many of our microprocessors uh, have this built-in capability. Uh, they have a special bit called the, the V-bit, uh, which is, uh, turns out to be a one if your two's complement math overflows. And so you can always check that. All right, well, so that's, um, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. And this will kind of be the end of the, the second part of the introduction to um, uh, computer engineering. So if you have any questions, uh, you can always track me down. I'm in the department. And um, you will no doubt see me in coming days because I teach uh, the gateway course of logic design uh, which you have to pass, but the good news is uh, it's a pretty easy course if you just do the work, and I'm and I grade pretty easily, so um, it's not a flunk out course. Although I guess it could be, but that's never my objective. Uh, and then I also teach Micro One, DSD, and Micro Two, and uh, so if you're doing computer engineering, you're almost for sure you have to take Micro One, you have to take DSD, and you probably will wind up taking Micro Two. So I'll see you for four courses before you're able to escape this institution. All right, we'll talk to you later, no doubt.